is growing steadily and I think rapidly in my opinion. And also some of you have reached out to make donations because one of the reasons that I do this and I produce this material is because I'm hoping to pay for my MA in the philosophy of religion. And that's not something I can afford as a father of two and a full-time pastor, but I'm hoping that that could be an area that I can further my research in. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, and thank you for supporting the uh, uh, the cause, um, for subscribing to the channel. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do it because I think the more and more that we've done this, uh, the better and better we've got at the process. And I hope that we can continue to bring you guys a uh, substantive discussion. But with all of that said, oh, and you can click any in the links of the, in the description to find out how to do that. Uh, now, with all that said, I have a very special guest with me, Dr. Joshua Kakane. Uh Dr. Kakane, would you just begin by telling us a little bit about your academic background and then what got you interested in this area? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I teach here at the, um, the Logos Institute uh, for Analytic and Exegetical Theology at St. Andrews. I, my background is actually in philosophy. I did my doctorate at the University of York. Uh, my interest has really always been on issues of spirituality. So I wrote a doctorate on Kierkegaard and um, Christian spirituality, uh, which uh, I developed into a book that came out last year. And then um, I came here to the Logos Institute in uh, four years ago, I think it was, and uh, I was a postdoc. And my interest really was in liturgy. That's that's the issue that, that kind of caught my attention. After working on spirituality for a number of years, I was interested to think about worship and what we're doing when we gather together and developing some of the excellent work that people like Terence Cuneo and Nick Walterstuff have been doing on this area. Um, but then when as soon as I started working on liturgy, uh, probably because I was hanging out with tons of uh, systematic theologians here, um, I kind of hit a, a, an area of theology which analytic folk just hadn't really done much about, which was what the church is. And, the more I tried to write about what liturgy, what we're doing when we participate in liturgy, the more I was realizing uh, we just need to think carefully about what the church is to be able to answer that question uh, in as in as full a way as possible. So that 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 really sparked my interest in in writing more about the nature of the church. And so for the past few years, that's really been my main research interest: is how can philosophy, analytic philosophy, help us to 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 uh, speak clearly um, and insightfully about what the church is. Yeah, yeah. So there's this growing interest in analytic theology on things like liturgy and worship. And then your area of focus was on Kierkegaard. And for anybody who wants to purchase um, that book that was just published, you can buy that in the description. And when you use those links, it actually helps me also. If that's something that I just learned I could do. So feel free to purchase that book on Kierkegaard. Um, and then you got into this new area, which I don't, it doesn't seem like there's really anybody um, writing on this area of what is being called analytic ecclesiology. So is there other kind of names that are contributing to the subject? I know there was like a journal article with a few people, but uh, Dr. F Faith, Faith Paul was one of them, but who are some of the other people working in this area? Yeah, so I mean, I think the area that comes under the umbrella of um, of liturgy that's received the most attention is, of, sorry, under the umbrella of ecclesiology is the discussion of liturgy, as you say. But then there are also people working on um, things like the sacraments. So James Arcadi at um, Trinity Evangelical School, um, Evangelical Divinity School has, uh, has an excellent book on the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and he's done some work on the nature of consecration. And I think all of these things have quite big implications for, uh, for ecclesiology. So there are people working in related areas. Um, but yeah, so that it's, it's a new and upcoming area, I think, in analytic theology that I think... I, I'm hoping I don't have the final word on. I want to spark mm -hmm. discussion on this. I want people to disagree with me and write more things on this area because I think it's it's important. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I thought about, and we're going to get into the paper, a view of the social ontology of the church. I think it's the name of the paper um, on analytic ecclesiology. But one of the things that I was thinking about as I was reading through it, I was thinking, well, how would an anti-realist, like what would that, uh, I mean, and you talk about the branch of group eliminativism. I'm thinking, what would the branch of group eliminativism want to say in response to this? And so maybe that is an area where there could be, you know, a lot more work done. Uh Hey, Dr. Cockaine, are you still with us? I think we may have uh, had some connectivity issue. For those of you who are with us, we're just currently in the process. I'm waiting for maybe Joshua Cockaine has to hop off and then hop back on. 
But uh, while he does that, I hope that you guys can take a look at the new descriptions, um, the new description box that we have. Uh, I think in there you're going to find a lot of things that you might be interested in. So now we can officially do uh, Amazon partnership. So then when you purchase the resources that we have, uh, you can also, or purchase the resources that we speak about, um, you also contribute to kind of what we're working on. Hey, Dr. Kalkin, you back with us. Yeah, the t terrible uh, UK universities, for those people who don't know, have terrible infrastructure because they're full of old buildings. Yeah. And so um, getting a decent broadband connection is a challenge. So no <laughs> sorry. Hopefully that won't happen again. So I'll, I'll try and stay with you. No problem. Yeah, we could cut that out after the uh, thing. Uh, well, cut that out, out to the stream. Um, so why don't you begin by taking us through the main question that this paper um, is seeking to answer? Yeah. Okay. So so really, this question is framed around a puzzle. I think, which is, uh, we profess if you if you say the creed in worship, um, or if you're committed to the creed, we confess that the church is one, uh, and so that seems to be just a a claim that theologically we should we should endorse. Um, however, if you look around the church, uh, if you look around all the different denominations or traditions within the church, so in case you guys had any doubts about whether or not <laughs> Dr. Conkade was exaggerating about not having good Wi-Fi in the UK, here is. The proof. <laughs> All right, we're going to give them another chance to reconnect. What I was saying about the, any of the links in the description is uh, no longer is there just a GoFundMe link in the description, uh, but you can also find Amazon links. And when those Amazon links are used, uh, a portion of those um, resources will be, uh, I guess, attributed to us. And so if there's any videos where you think, man, like there was a conversation that I would love to speak about. Uh, with uh, a certain professor or uh, a certain book that you would certain like to read because of a conversation we had with the professor, uh, feel free to let me know and I'll put those links in the description so that you guys can not only get the resources I hope you're interested in getting, but also uh, go ahead and get, um, but also go ahead and, you know, continue to support in other ways. So yeah, we're just going to give Dr. Cocaine another minute to hop back on and hopefully this time we can get it right. Oh, um, so while we wait, though, let me go ahead and ask you guys this question. I know we have a couple of you watching. Uh, what are some of the faith traditions that you come from? So uh, I'm a student pastor at a Southern Baptist church. That means I come from a very low church tradition. And I get very uncomfortable, personally, when people talk about the church, capital C. So, yeah, if you guys would just comment in the description, uh, what are the faith traditions, traditions that you guys come from? Uh, I see we got Scott Heath uh, in the comment section. How's it going, Scott? Scott, and if you could tell me, where are you from? Just curious. Like, uh, what part of the country? Well, I'm going to try to give it a little bit more time. Hopefully, we can get Dr. Cocaine back on any second. trying to think of something interesting I could do for you guys while we wait for him to come back on. Let me see if I can pull up the paper uh, that we're going to be actually talking through. Dr. Joshua Kalkane, Analytic Theology, View of Analytic Ecclesiology and Social Ontology of the Church. So if I share my screen on this, I wonder if you guys will be able to get it the way that I see it.
Hey, I think you're back with us. <laughs> yeah, so I've moved. I've moved location. Hopefully, this will sort the problem out. So sorry okay. about this. <laughs> um, so you want to give it a, a, another? Let's give it two more goes. Like if it happens one more time, we'll try it again, and then we'll give it. We'll give three chances at it. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah sounds okay. good. Sorry about that. Um, for your camera angle, could you just go a little bit to the left, uh, or to you? Yeah, to your right. To your right. Like that. Yeah, that way you're a little bit more centered on the the frames that we have set up from before. Um, okay, good. So, so yeah, the question that we were getting ready to answer is, uh, what is the question that this paper that we're speaking about is seeking to uh, seeking to answer? Yeah. So the question that I'm really looking at is, given that in the Christian tradition we claim uh, to profess that the church is one, uh, the church is one body, uh, the church is Christ's body. Um, how could it be possible that um, such a claim could be true, given that uh, it's it's apparent that if you look around the church across the world, the church isn't united. It isn't united in belief. It's not united in practice. And so how could it be that this is one and, one and the same body, despite all the apparent disagreement and division within its between its members? So that, that's really the puzzle that I'm, I'm setting to explore in the paper. Yeah. And would you say that that divide is kind of sharpened by certain parts of the body that refuse to kind of recognize, you know, other parts. So for example, I mean, like, I'm not, I guess, of the opinion that that Catholics are, are not real Christians. And I don't know if there's many Catholics that are of the opinion that, you know, the things that we believe are, are you know, heretical or not really Christian. And so would you say that somewhat sharpens the divide uh, when it comes to church unity, uh, to, to the question that your paper, paper is trying to answer on church unity? Yeah, I think it does. I think whenever there's that kind of, um, question about who's in and who's out the, those issues come to the fore i think the thing that come that i want to stress in my paper and in my work is that uh, the way to address that is not to seek is not um perhaps unintuitively through a kind of ecumenical move in which we enforce a kind of unity uh, from below on the church and say like no look we have to all believe the same things we have to all act in the same way I think that's not to take seriously the, the theological claims about the church's unity. Yeah. But you're right that when those disagreements come about, that's when the, the issue becomes sharpened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, because some people, if you if you look at the title of this book, when it talks about finding the key to church unity or defining church unity, uh, you guys may think that this <laughs> a video about ecumenism or something. <laughs> it isn't at all. So uh so let's outline some of the minimal theological claims that you think we as Christians should hold to about the church. Yeah, so in the paper, I outline a number of claims. And I think I think it's worth saying these are a mixture of some of them are theological claims, which I think you can derive from scripture or from uh, from the creeds. Um, some of them, I think, are just empirical claims, which strike me as true um, about the existing forms of the church. Um so first of all, I think uh, we should say that uh, there is such a thing as the church. I think maybe this sounds surprising, um, but I, I think in some Christian circles, you'd be, um, you don't hear all that much about the church as a global body. You hear stuff about discipleship and personal faith, but actually the communal nature of faith sometimes not talked about enough. Um, and if we're going to talk about the, the church as a body, uh, as a broad body which encompasses people from around the world, um, then the thing to say is that uh, that the constituent parts of the church are made up of uh, congregations and denominations, but also individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, so that the church is diverse in its membership. Um, and then, so then the next the next um, observation or constraint is is really an empirical one, which is that of all the people that. Uh, seem to belong to the church, the one body. Uh, there isn't a unity in practice or theology or belief um, ar- around a number of issues, as we've already been talking about. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the next thing to say is, and this again is a theological point, which is uh, that the members of the church and the church itself, in some sense, it is sinful. And the disunity that arises in the church uh, comes about through the sin of the members and the the congregations which form Mm -hmm. uh, the church. And then the last two claims which I explore um, are really the uh, um, theological claims which I think you find clearly in the New Testament. So Mm -hmm. one of them is that the Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who unites the the actions of the members of the church to respond to God in worship through Christ. 
And then lastly, that Jesus Christ is the the head or the foundation of the church. Yeah. So they're the, they're the constraints that I'm working under and then seeing how far philosophy can help us to, to think through these claims. Yeah. So, so just so you guys know, the, the claim that we're seeking to, to, I guess, reinforce is that the church can be one, but yet to be right. divided and divided in the sense that we're actually defining right now. So the first claim is that there is a, such a thing as the church. Now, yeah. this is actually the claim that I think is probably the most <laughs> problematic because I think we don't dis we don't even agree <laughs> on what that means. So the, the the bare minimum is there are individual disciples of Christ. Okay, all right, and, yeah. and then sometimes these individual disciples gather together in corporate worship. Right. Number two. Now, I yeah. guess would you go from there to say there therefore there is such a thing as the church, like the capital C church that exists alongside not just the disciples, not just the communities but like that encompasses all of these things. And it's not just a, a thing that's useful to use, like to address to all Christians, but it's an actual thing that exists. Yeah, I think um, it's hard for me to remain faithful to the, the witness of the Christian tradition and say no to that question. Um, I think it's clear that there is such a thing as the church. And for one, I don't know how to make sense of the New Testament claims about the church as the people of God, the body of Christ, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to make sense of those claims if they're just kind of mere collections of individual believers. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's where kind of the rubber is going to meet the road when we get into the questions of, of these realist ontology. So the second thing is that there's this diversity that exists within the church um, yeah. and, and our, our faith, our practice, our beliefs. Um, this diversity is due to sinful attitudes. Um, but, and I think everyone should agree to this. And there's nothing I think that's very like, uh, questionable that we are united by the spirit to be led in worship and that we are mm -hmm. under the head uh, which is Christ and that is who we submit to as our ultimate authority so these are all claims that I think are relatively like easy e even if you just think about your local church <laughs> you're gonna say all of these things are probably true when right. you're sitting with your deacons at the you know deacon board so uh let's uh let's go into some different ways of framing how the church can be one but yet be so diverse the first way is this anti-realist way of group of yeah. limitativism so why don't you introduce introduce us to the subject of social ontology and then yeah. talk about group of limitativism yeah of course yeah so the so this is so what i'm trying to do in the second half of this paper is to say look given and i think we kind of agree on these basic claims right there might be some um pushback on on how we frame them but given we're on board about these theological claims what can we say what how can philosophy help us to unpack these and an obvious place to go is to think about the the philosophy of social groups because there's been a lot of work in particularly in the last um the last two decades on thinking about um how social groups how we should think about the metaphysics of social groups and it's worth just saying why i think some of this literature exists um it's things like the financial crash in which um large uh, multinational corporations seem to be the cause of uh, wrongdoing of some kind of ethical wrong in the world um, that we need to be able to say how that could be the case. Um, often in these kind of cases, um, or another example that you might give is uh, a large oil uh, corporation spilling oil in uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it might be in a lot of these cases, no individual is responsible for all that much, but yet some great wrongdoing has happened. So that's the kind of the starting point of how a lot of this discussion of social ontology um, comes about. But there are, as you said, um, people that are skeptics about what what we mean by these things. And so really the, the claim that I'm calling uh, group elimitivism just is, a, just is to say that, um, that anything that we want to say about groups um, is ultimately reducible to claims that we say about members. Um, that, that's really the claim of group elimitivism. Um, and I think throughout this debate, um, you'll see very clearly that there's a very strong parallel with the philosophy of mind, which I think a lot of people are more, more familiar with. So questions in the philosophy of mind say, basically ask, what's the relationship between uh, physical properties and mental properties, between our bodies and our minds? Um, and the, the, the group of limitivist position is just like the position in the philosophy of mind, which says, um, when you're feeling pain, all you mean to say when you say I'm in pain is there's an there's a certain neuron firing in my brain. 
That's all that sentence means, yeah. right? And, and similarly, when we talk about groups, the eliminativist wants to say, if I say, um, shell spill oil in the Gulf of Mexico, I all I mean to say is, uh, the CEO made a decision to spill oil in the Gulf of Mexico or something like that, right? Gotcha. Good, good. So, so the, the whole question of social ontology has arisen for, you know, other matters, for example, it seems like we should be able to hold political and, you know, um, economic groups morally responsible and morally culpable. And the group were limited to this, like another, any kind of reductionist or nominalist, you know, is going, they're going yeah. to want to say that these things reduce to something that's more concrete and less abstract in, in most mm -hmm. instances or in, in, in every instance. So what are the dangers of using this approach to talk about the church? Because I would say that this approach was the one, I'm not saying I'm sold out, like I, the only thing I've ever read about it was from you, but I would say that this approach was the one that I, I guess came off as most intuitive to me because it eliminated the need to have some abstract uh, you know, existing. So yeah. what would you say are the dangers of taking this approach? Yeah, so I mean, the dangers more generally, I think, are that we want to say things about groups. And I think we, uh, we, when we, when we talk about groups, what we mean is uh, we, we try and say something true about the world. So when I say that um, there's corruption at the heart of a political party, um, I'm saying something true, which doesn't just bottom out at talk about individuals. It says something about how those individuals interact and give rise to these group level qualities. Um, so that so I think the real issue for social ontology is this issue of responsibility. Mm -hmm. if, if you say that eliminativism is true, then when uh, this kind of systemic wrongdoing happens, it's true that no one is to blame in some cases. There's there's no agent um, in which blame, wrongdoing can be attached to. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the, the, the worry. I mean, I, I think that there are independent theological reasons to be skeptical though, because I, um, I think it's quite clear that uh, the way the New Testament talks about the church as social reality is not just a mere convenient way of saying that we should value one another. Um, I think it's trying to pick out uh, something real that individual believers are drawn into. We are drawn into the community of faith through the work of the Holy Spirit um, to be Jesus' body in the world. I think those claims uh, we should take seriously. They're not just uh, they're not just uh, kind of mere metaphors that are pointing us to uh, a, a kind of something nice about about the Christian faith. Yeah. So so the the group of limited of this is going to kind of be burdened with the task of reducing some of these claims about the the one body of Christ or being grafted in uh, to the olive tree or you know being the bride of Christ. Uh, so taking a lot of these these different biblical pictures of the church and having to reduce that down to something that is basically applied to individuals or the spirit being in the temple of God. And, and just basically saying, oh, yeah. this justified. So that would be the, that, that's the danger of all kinds of nominalism, I guess. It's like, well, now you got to yeah. come up with this paraphrastic strategy. And uh, those can be kind of unlikely. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say on the problems of group eliminativism? No, I, I think it's worth just saying that the, the issue of the systemic wrongdoing is not something that's unique to um, corporations and organizations. I mean, I think if you look at um, the Old Testament, I think this kind of corporate ethic is, you can find it in a lot of places. If you go and look in Amos, where you see God um, deny the worship of uh, the Israelites, the reason is because they lacked, the people lacked justice. Now, I, I don't, I think it would be strange to think, I think actually it would be a modernist, uh, it would be a kind of modern imposition of our ideals onto the text to say that what's going on there is that God is condemning individual acts of justice. Mm -hmm. That might be the case, but in those passages, it looks like what he's doing is condemning Israel as an unjust nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think you need at least some very minimal account of group realism to make sense of those claims. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So let's move on to the different ways to think about group realism. So you give about three yeah. uh, different ways, but you kind of break them on, it, break them up into redundant and non-redundant group realism. So would you just kind of briefly spell out yeah. those distinctions? Yeah. So I think it's worth saying here that here I'm really just drawing on uh, a, a really influential book in social ontology uh, by philosophers called uh, Christian List and Philip Petit. It's called uh, Group Agency. 
So if you go and look at that book, you'll see these distinctions drawn out. I think the other thing to say, I'll outline the difference as they see it, but I actually, since I wrote this paper, I've changed my mind on some of these questions. So maybe we could talk about that at some point. Sure. Um, but the, the realist, the difference that List and Petit draw between redundant and non-redundant realism uh, goes something like this. Suppose we can talk about uh, groups as these, as, as agents that are capable of acting in the world in certain ways and mm -hmm. perhaps being responsible of, um, of certain things. Um, there, there are I, two broad, diff broadly different ways you could go about making a claim like this. The first of which they identify as being a, uh, found in a kind of uh, in in the political philosophy of people like Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, that they're calling um, redundant realism. And the reason they call it this is because everything we want to say about the group, we just want to say about one individual within that group. So the, the classic example of, that they want to give of a redundant realism is a dictatorship. It might be true um, that a dictatorship, um, say, uh, let's let's pick let's let's take an example like North Korea, right? It might be the case that uh, we can make true claims about North Korea, like North Korea values, um, I don't know, a certain kind of uh, music or a certain kind of I, uh, political ideal. But all we really mean when we say that is. Uh, the person who's in the position to make decisions values a certain kind of music or a certain kind of political ideal. Yeah. And so the reason they call it redundant realism is because we can make true statements about the group, but they just bottom out at the leader. Yeah. Uh, they, we don't say anything about the relationship between the leader and the group, Good. or at least that's what they, they, they claim. Okay, so the, the redundant realist, um, if we're going to use that term, is basically saying, well, I want to speak like the realist still, but <laughs> yeah. when you get down to the metaphysics of why I can speak this way, why I can attribute these statements to groups, I'm going to give you some yeah. concretist or some uh, uh, yeah. uh, non-realist interpretation anyways, but yeah. they just want to reserve the language, I guess, kind of. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the non-redundant realism in contrast to this, um, it, it's always going to say something more complex. It's not just going to appeal to the the attitudes um, yeah. of one individual, but it's going to say something about how individuals coordinate within a group okay. to give rise to group level attitudes. Okay, so there's and going so, to be more of a, a yeah. story there. Okay. Yeah, there's and and actually the the important thing to say about um, non redundant realism, it's going to look vastly different in different cases, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about how um, it might be that we form a group and we make decisions by voting, right? Uh, so we sit down and we, we say, what's the best course of action for, um, for a university? And we've, some people have been given authority to vote and some people haven't. Um, and they vote and they decide that the best course of action is that we're gonna offer this new master's course, right? Um, by means of that voting procedure, the group has derived certain attitudes. But actually, sometimes groups make don't make decisions like that at all. Sometimes it's way more spontaneous than that. Um, we might just uh, have a kind of tacit agreement that this is the right thing to do. Um, in a smaller group, say, we might just go for coffee and say, are we all agreed that this is the best course of action? Um, and that, that might be sufficient for, um, for making group level decisions, which yeah. then become the, the attitudes of the group. So, so the I guess the burden on the on the group realist is going to say, okay, now we need a story to say what what exactly is this thing that makes us one, All right? Now, so we're going to say there's this thing right. that makes us one group, but but what is it that makes us this one group? And so I think that can kind of lead us into the different versions of group realism. And for anybody following along, uh, group realism is the what the direction we're going to want to go to maintain our theological claims. Right. So. Uh, uh, what well, you said, you changed your mind on some issues. Do you want to talk about that now? Or you want to bring that up later? Yeah, yeah, we can do. So I, so the, so I think the distinction List and Petit make between redundant and non-redundant group realism, um, is not is not a good distinction. And so I'm I'm persuaded by it. there's a philosopher called Stephanie Collins who's a, um, I think she's a um, ACU in Australia, um, who's got a book called Group Duties, um, and she thinks that. Um, that in a case of a dictatorship or a tyranny, uh, we should still admit that they are group realists in a non-redundant sense. And that the reason for that is because when leaders act in certain ways in a dictatorship, they act as leaders. Um, and so the, the, the attitudes of the group are not necessarily 
identical to the attitudes as the leader, even in a very uh, authoritarian um, group, like a dictatorship. Um, it might still be the case that a dictator makes a decision on behalf of a group rather than just representing their own attitudes. Now, I think the reason this is significant is because I actually think that's probably the closest uh, parallel to the, the kind of agency of the church that we have. Um, I think the church is a kind of uh, is a kind of dictatorship, but uh, one that's grounded in uh, the kind of dictator that we would want to follow. So that's the account that I'm 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 trying to develop in the book that I'm writing at the moment, and so that's why that that disagreement I think is quite important for what we might want to say. Okay, then let's come back to that at the end because I'm 100% yeah. sure there's more that I need to find out yeah, yeah. about that. So so let's talk about some of these some of the other alternatives. Uh, to group realism, and if you could just briefly spell them out, yeah. um, and then we'll talk more about how they actually account yeah. for the theological claims. So let's talk about an authorization theory, um, and so yeah. what is what is it, and how does it account for the claims we want to maintain? Yeah, so the authorization theory, we've, this will be really quick, because this is basically, well, we're already talking about redundant group realist theories. For, according to Liston Petit, authorization theories like Hobbes or Rousseau or Locke, uh, they are just redundant group realist theories. They're groups where the agency of the group uh, is just dependent on an individual or a small group of individuals. And we don't need to say anything more about the complex decision making that goes on. Yeah, I like that. How does how does it account for the the uh, theological claims that we want to maintain? So increasingly, I'm becoming um, attracted to that as a as an account of the church. I think one of the things that it does captures well is to say that actually the agency of the church is derived from yeah. a fairly small set of um, people of persons namely uh, the persons of the trinity and so we are the, the agency of the church and the oneness of the church is derived from god not from uh, our own human structures mm -hmm. and so the attractive thing about this position is it says that we are we are most truly one when we are um, submitted to uh, the source of authority in the church, namely the persons of the Trinity. And so I think that there's something about authorization theories that captures um, captures the, the oneness of the church very well. Yeah, yeah. And so so just what we're going to be looking for is that, that, that glue, right? What is the glue that actually makes the church one, just to give some people yeah. a picture? And on this theory, we're saying that what goes into this concept of the church unity is that we as the church, and I think this would hold true for at least every true Christian in congregations, is that we're all trying our best, you know, to be submissive to the same authority, which are the persons yeah. of the Trinity. So that is the thing that right. makes us one. Right. And so then, now let me ask you this on that on that theory, then, because that feels redundant. You know, it feels like, a OK, well, then when I'm just speaking about the, the church, I'm just speaking about the, the group of individuals who are equally submitted to you know the authority of of uh persons of the trinity mm -hmm. i guess would you say that that doesn't have the same problems of you know something like a, a eliminative a lim i can't even say that word uh, uh not <laughs> yeah 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 i think what it what what we're able to say if we have a group realist approach that we can't on an eliminativist approach is um there's a sense in which when i act in the world um, as the body of Christ, as a member of the body of Christ, I represent the body of Christ in the world. Okay. Um, and, and I think it's very hard to make sense of that claim if we don't want to say anything about groups. Um, because it looks like for the, for the anti-realist or the limitivist, um, that kind of claim is just, um, it's really just shorthand for saying that I, I'm an individual with a certain, um, identity or set of beliefs. But actually, I think I do want to say that I not only represent Christ in the world, but in some sense, I represent you when I act um, as the body of Christ. Okay. Okay, I can see that. Now, I, I feel like, so for example, going back to our, our uh, group of limited to this um, uh, examples, for, like, so like not talking about the church for a second, talking about like a political party, you say like a political uh, pundit, you know, he goes on the media, <laughs> he says something ridiculous. And now this statement is attributed to all of you know the people who hold his political opinion. Um, it, would it be something similar to that? Like, well, 
you can actually attribute this rightly to this party's um, uh, uh, representation in in the community yeah. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, any kind of group realism is you're going to have to have an account of who is authorized to speak on behalf of the group and who isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, if somebody just if just a random member of a political party stands up and says, I'm so sorry for our terrible performance in the last elections, mm -hmm. uh, that's not the same as when um, when the leader of the political party stands up. We just had an election here in the UK and um, the, the Labour Party, which is the second biggest party here, didn't perform as well as they expected. And the leader stood up and he said, uh, I'm so sorry for how we've performed. Uh, now, he, as the elected leader of that party, has the authorization, has been authorized to say that on behalf of the group. Yeah. And for that, apolo that apology to be meaningful in some way. Um, say I was a member of the Labour Party. If I stood up and said that, it wouldn't have the same effect, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 So, so we have our authorization theory, and you yeah. think the authorization theory actually is going to hold up pretty good? Yeah. So I think you can actually make this is where perhaps some of my ideas have changed since I wrote this paper. Um, I think you can make sense of the authorization theory through through the function list account. Um, I think they're not as those two accounts are not as different as List and Petit claim they are, yeah. and in fact, um, authorization account like the kind of uh, dictatorship examples are just a certain kind of group realism example that you yeah. can explain using these functionalist terms. Yeah, and, and I get the feeling from looking at the chart that there's a lot of ways in which this can be an, an expanded, you know, it, and right. it can be expanded and not only can it be expanded, but uh, they're not necessarily exclusive. It's kind of going to depend on what it is that you want to talk about, you know? Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on to the animation theory. I like the animation yeah. theory. I thought it was the most mystical. <laughs> so uh, yeah. What is the animation theory, and uh, how does it account yeah. for these claims? Yeah. So the so animation theory is uh, coming out of uh, a kind of uh, post-Hegelian metaphysics, um, in which there's a strong emphasis on societies having a spirit or a geist, um, which is is real in some sense. Um, but it's it's not very easy to pin down precisely what that means. Yes. Um, maybe this is just the kind of somebody that's trained in an analytic philosophy background balking at a kind of <laughs> a different way of doing philosophy. Um, but I think it's worth saying that these these theories um, press very heavy on organic metaphor and suggestive language. That um, there's some sense in which society is um, is more than the sum of its parts. But when we try and press in what sense that is, I find it difficult to figure out exactly what it means. But the animation theories essentially say that when groups of people uh, coordinate, uh, they bring about something which is distinct from the individuals. Now, it, if you go back to the philosophy of mind example that I used earlier, I think the easiest way to see what uh, what this means is to think um, think about the way in which the substance dualist wants to think about the relationship between minds and bodies. That is. Clearly, there's a close relationship between minds and bodies. I mean, even Descartes wants to say, like, there, there's obviously a very interconnected relationship. Yeah. But since we can make um, a distinction between minds and bodies, we should say that they are um, of separate substances, or um, at the very least, that um, they don't depend on one another. Yeah, for sure. And so there, I think the animation theory, and I, I say I think because I, I'm, I'm not sure that I entirely understand how it, what the what the grounding of it is metaphysically yeah. but the claim is that there's something distinct about groups which can't be explained only in talk of, by talk of individuals coordinating in certain ways yeah yeah when i when i think of uh, uh animalism like as going back to the kind of philosophy of mind discussion i, I think it's animalism that kind of trades on the notion of there being life in an agent that kind of uh uh, uh substantiates claims or it's about the continuity of its uh, identity. I think I'm getting that correctly. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, it's these life processes that are ongoing throughout the individual's, you know, uh, existence that kind of give it this uh, ability to kind of sustain succession. Um, could you, I guess, maybe attribute something like that to this theory and say, well, it's the church's ongoing processes of, you know, worship or, or, or whatever. It's the ongoing life of the church that sustains its un unified spirit. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you could say that. And I think, so So here's the thing to say about animation theories is clearly like, 
if you look at the metaphors that Paul uses in the New Testament, a lot of them are organic metaphors. So there's, I mean, there's an attraction here to animation theories. And I think they, yeah. and also the other thing that I think the theories have going for them is that we do want to say that there's a, there's a mystery to the church that can't, that an analytic philosopher can't sit down and figure out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so it being mysterious is not a, is not um, a mark against it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we can get most of the claims we want to make without um, without invoking this kind of, um, I, I'm trying to find another word other than mysterious here, but this undefined relation between individuals and groups. So yeah. I, I want to say that the relationship is uh, one of supervenience, not one of reduction, but then not one of this kind of emergence or yeah. this kind of dualist relation, but it's one of supervenience, which means um, if we talk about something at the group level, it always supervenes on something at the individual level. That, that, whereas the animation theory would, would, I think, wants to deny that claim, wants to say that there's more than, uh, there's something more going on than what's going on at the individual level. Good, good, good. All right, and then, so let's finally talk about um, the functionalist model and then the modified functionalist model, which uh, yeah. I guess was the model that you sort of embraced uh, towards the end of the paper. Yeah. Um, yeah, how does it compare to the other model? How does it compare to these other models? Yeah, so I think the functionalist model um, wants to say, I think maybe there's an important claim just to pull apart the functionalist from the animation theory. So uh, one of the claims that List and Petit want to make is that, um, and it relates to what I was just saying about supervenience, is that uh, individual agency is needs to be upheld in some way. That is. Uh, that when we talk about what's going on in groups, there's no sense in which uh, the group undermines my own agency in making decisions. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the relationship has to go the other way. That is yeah. that the gr groups emerge out of individual decision making. Whereas the animation theory wants to say that actually that I think there's more of a two way, two -way relationship going on between individuals and groups. Yeah. Um, so the functionalists, I think, um, again, think back to the philosophy of mind, uh, the functionalist wants to say that when, just like the functionalist in the philosophy of mind wants to say that when physical properties function in a certain way, uh, they we can say things which are true of the whole, which are not true of the parts. Mm -hmm. That's precisely what the functionalist about groups wants to say, which is that through the interaction of members, through certain organizational structures, um, we can say things which are true of the group, which are not uh, simply true of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, to say that um, to say that Israel acted unjustly when God uh, is addressing Israel in Amos five is not just to say that um, some individuals acted unjustly. It's to say something about the way in which individuals that constitute that nation interact uh, and the way that they function as a whole. Um, and that's consistent. I think it's important to know that's consistent with there being people that are acting justly within an unjust um, nation. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for what's going on in, in social ontology is and why we need something that's not redundant um, or anti-realist, which is to say uh, you can be a member of an unjust group and act justly. Um, there's not a one to one correlation between group attitudes and individual attitudes. Good, good. So, so we all want to retain this concept that there's going to be this group agency and this individual agency. But what we don't want is that group agency somehow interferes or impinges upon right. uh, individual agency. And so what the functionalist can do is say, well, when individuals function together to either set up an unjust system, for example, or even mm -hmm. uh, uh, knock down an unjust system, you can now attribute something to the group that you can't necessarily attribute to all the individuals in that right. in that uh in that group that's so right that's the, the basic that's right. idea okay so yeah. it, w is there anything you want to add to what um what you go after at the end which is the modified functionalist model yeah i think the thing to say about the functionalist account is if you go and read someone like mr petit they spend 70 80 percent of their book talking about how groups are structured so that they can perform rationally um, as one group agent. So they spend a lot of time talking about these issues of what they call group aggregation, um, such that we can groups can perform consistently and can be held responsible for their actions. 
Now, I think the reason that I don't think functionalism really gets at what's going on in the church is for the reasons we talked about at the beginning is because uh, if there's unity in the church, it doesn't come about because we figured out how to act well together. Yeah. Right. And this is where the functionalist discussions in group social ontology are um, just not that helpful for theology. Yeah. Um, but the insight which comes from them is to say that um, when individuals act together in certain ways, they can function as one. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that's the insight, and that and that leads to 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 the, what I'm calling in that paper the modified functionalist model. Okay. Okay. So the problem that we have with functionalism isn't that it doesn't work, because like you talk about the hive of bees, for example, like it may very well work for certain. Right. Groups, but it's definitely not something that works for the church, given our diversity claims, which is that there's yeah. uh, theological, behavioral, you know, religious diversity within the church that is not good. You know, it's due to sin. So we're going to need something different than that to capture that claim. So so what is modified functionalist? Uh, what does modified functionalism give us? Yeah, so, so I don't know how modified it is, right? But here's, I can tell you, I can tell you the kind of starting point for what, what the argument is, which is, so List and Petit, when they set up their account of um, of group agency, have this really suggestive paragraph, which I quote in the paper, where they say, um, they say, we're going to focus on looking at how human beings interact to bring about group agents through this kind of intentional group, uh, this intentional interaction between members. But of course, that might not be the only way of getting group agency. I mean, this is they, they literally have like two sentences on this, which I think was I find incredibly provocative. And they said, they say, well, look at how honeybees um, coordinate to to find nest sites in the spring. Uh, they don't have a kind of their consciousness doesn't rise to the level of us being able to say they have these kind of intentional organizational structures, but yet they appear to function as one hive. And then the other example they give is to say. Um, look at the way in which a terrorist cell functions. Uh, the individuals who are acting on behalf of the group might have absolutely no idea of how their actions are contributing to the actions of the group as a whole. All they do is they respond to their, um, their coordinators who tell them to perform certain acts and when to not perform certain acts. Gotcha. And so this in particular give these two examples and they say, look, we can get a kind of functionalist agency even if there's no coordination present at all. But then they don't expand that account at all because that's not what they're after. But I think the, those two examples are actually incredibly fruitful for thinking about um, what's going on in the church. Because as I feel like I've, if I've repeated one point, I think it's because it, this is the most important point. Which, and, and the reason I think these are good examples of what's going on in the church is because our unity doesn't come from the coordination of our actions. Gotcha. It comes from somewhere else. Gotcha. So, so what we're after is that, okay, so now what we see in these two sentences is that this functional unity and coordination are not necessarily, or not essential to each other. So there are some yeah. counterexamples that show us that this, there's a functional unity without the supposed coordination that one would expect to find. And right. maybe that's, <laughs> that's the trick because we're definitely not coordinated, you know, um, as yeah. a church in most instances. So, so what would that look like for the church? Yeah, so here's where I think there's a bit of a puzzle. And I think as Protestants, we have a harder time get, making sense of this because we don't have a kind of centralized structure, which we we want to identify as the yeah. church, right? That's immediately what comes um, to mind, like the magisterium. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. But but so so let's think about different ways in which diversity might arise. Um, let, go back to the terrorist example. Or, there's another example which I've given it elsewhere, which is the the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the way in which it, um, like none of the actors are aware of how their performances contribute to the larger narrative. They just do what they're told, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it might be, so there's an example I give it elsewhere. Uh, Mark Ruffalo goes on national television and he, he spoils the plot line of, um, of the next Marvel film. Okay. See, the problem with this example is I don't like Marvel and I don't know anything about it. So I'm gonna <laughs> immediately trip up somewhere. But so Mark Ruffalo goes on TV and he acts um, against the will of the MCU. But yet at the same time, he represents the MCU when he speaks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a really helpful analog of thinking about what's going on with um, when, a, when, when we as individuals act on behalf of the church, <clears throat> but in a way which um, is seeking to undermine the unity of the church. 
But, okay. but contrast that contrast that example with an example in which um, we watch we watch a couple of Marvel films and we we think there's no way that these two things can be consistent. I just can't see how it could be the case that these two plot lines could be consistent. Uh, but the reason that we think that's the case is because uh, it's all going to be revealed in the final film of the the series, right? In which everything's going to be held together in ways that we could never have imagined. Mm -hmm. Now, I think both of these forms of diversity are present in the church. Sometimes diversity occurs because we act in ways which are not in line with the will of the spirit. And sometimes diversity occurs because we can't understand how two things can be consistent. Mm -hmm. Now, how you tell the difference between those things, that is the problem of Protestantism, right? That's how <laughs> that that's just the problem that we live with. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that I can solve that problem. I just think um, we have to try and figure that out. <laughs> Okay, because that's the question I'm left with, like <laughs> this big question mark of, well, then what is the gray area? Like, when is that going to be cleared up kind of thing? But, uh, okay, so so you got these two concepts of diversity <laughs> yeah. on offer, right? So you got this, you you actually do represent the group. So like Mark Ruffalo, but you just act yeah. against the the will of, of the, the, the coordinators, the larger, you know, representatives uh, for that group. And then you have this diversity that arises because we just can't, seem to find out the consistency. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of, of taking this uh, modified functionalist approach? Yeah, so I think um, I think that the benefits really are that it gives us everything we want to say theologically mm -hmm. about the church's unity. Um, and it and I think the, the I mean, it's not that the other models couldn't provide this, but I think uh, this model for me puts an emphasis on where the unity of the church should be, which is in bringing our own agency in line with the agency of the spirit. Mm -hmm. I think for me that it, that's what uh, unity of the church has to come back to yeah. is this issue. And I think that's what the, that's what the functionalist model helps to shed light on in, in some really helpful way. Yeah. But I think from an, as a, I guess the analytic philosopher in me wants to say, I just don't know what these mysterious group entities are if they're not entirely dependent on individuals. Like, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's not like I'm going around and seeing, um, but just there is something intangible that I can't put my finger on when we're talking about a society. I guess as somebody that has been trained to look for explanations, I find that dissatisfying. That's not to say it can't be the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this, uh, there's no reason theologically that we can't say that, uh, mm -hmm. The church is one because it functions as one in some important sense. Yeah. Yeah. So so just to kind of hopefully recap kind of where we're at in the conversation, because I don't know if anybody feels like they're Yeah, we've covered a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so so what we're after is a modified functionalism. So this unity yeah. that come arises from this functionality of individuals. And and one of the ways we can get that with this modified functionalism is we can say this functionality for the church is equal submission under the Holy Spirit, who's drawing us into worship. So you got functionalism yeah. in our submission. And yeah. that kind of functionalism allows for this diversity that can arise from whether it be gray areas right. or these bad actors who are just, you know, they're like Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. <laughs> they're, just, they're just doing that <laughs> on our part. Uh, so so that's where we're at. And and you have, you have doubts about this. This is an open question for you still. Do I have doubts about uh, which part in particular? About this this solution, like you you feel like there's more to be done. In, in, in yeah, I I mean I don't know if I would say so. So, so I think with all analytic theology, yeah, um, we should just be modest about what we're trying to do, right? Uh, I I this is not supposed to be a kind of all things considered account of what the church is, or even an all things considered account of how the church is united. This is a kind of um, an exercise in exploring ideas, which can help us to shed light on some important theological claims. Yeah. Um, but I think analytic theology should always retain that kind of modesty in saying that yeah. actually, we that that's only going to get us so far. Mm -hmm. um, I think if if it's helped us to see that actually what the church needs is more dependence on the the Holy Spirit, then I'm all for it. Um, I just think we shouldn't pretend. I, I'm not trying to pretend that I'm. I've given a full, exhaustive explanation of the church. Yeah. So yeah, I I um, I think it's a model that helps to say something interesting. I I'm under no pretenses that it's 
perfect or that it solves all yeah. of our problems in ecclesiology? I think, I think it definitely raises a lot of questions. Um, a lot of good questions and interesting questions to talk about. I mean, have you, I know you've written uh, on this subject in other areas. Um, have you done a more exegetical work on a kind of supporting the six theological claims that we start off with, started off with? Yeah. So I have a, I have a chapter in, um, so there's a, a book that came out of the LA theology conference um, which was edited by Oliver Crisp and uh, Fred Sanders uh, on the third person of the Trinity. I have a paper in there, which I think is basically an updated version of the same argument, but it has a it has much more exegetical discussion in that. And in particular, I unpack the way in which Paul is using um, using social political philosophy to explain the oneness yeah. of the church in First Corinthians. So I've done a bit more work on. Um, on that in the book that i'm just about finishing at the moment um there's a i i've i've done there's a bit more accessible work so i have a chapter on the church as the body of christ which is obviously unpacking that notion more in the in the biblical text so yeah i have i, I i've done a bit more work thinking about how we make sense of these things in the new testament Good. i think the interesting thing to say about the way paul talks about the body in um in first corinthians is um just the way in which Paul is drawing from um, political texts of his own time. If you go away and read scholars like uh, Margaret Mitchell or um, Dale Martin um, and there's somebody else, Andrew Byers, there's some interesting guys working on this um, who basically tell us that, I mean, I'm no New Testament scholar, right? But I have to take their word for it, that Paul is... Um, is drawing quite heavily on political texts which were very common and which his audience would have been familiar with mm -hmm. which were used politically to help to to urge uh, nations to stay united in times of difficulty sure. um, and paul is taking and even the the metaphor of the body i mean you can find it in people they're kind of similar metaphors in plato's republic mm -hmm. and you can see them in uh, various political texts of the time so paul's taking these political metaphors but he's flipping them on the head. So there's the, there's a line in First Corinthians 12 where Paul says, um, just as it is with the body, so it is with, and you think the answer should be the church. But the answer that he gives is, so it is with Christ. And so I think here you see a really, this is a point we've been talking about the whole, the whole discussion. Um, this is not just a socially enforced unity akin to, a kind of political unity um if there's a unity of the body of believers it's in christ not because of their because they they identify as one political body yeah um, it's because they were baptized by the one spirit into the one body of christ mm -hmm. so i think you see um i'm not saying that paul's endorsing a kind of functionalist metaphysics here or anything but i think you see this point coming out really clearly in first corinthians that paul is stressing that the unity of the body is in Christ and yeah. it's in being drawn into the life of Christ that we find unity. Good, good, good. Uh, well, we're going to go ahead and end there. Me and you will still be on yeah. uh, Zoom after our discussion is over. Uh, would you go ahead and tell people where's the best place to find and keep up with your research, Dr. Kakane? Yeah, so you can, you can, uh, I've got a live update of uh, my research on my personal website. So if you go to joshuacocaine.weebly.com, um, then you can find, I, I update my publications list fairly regularly and you should be able to find some uh, drafts of my work on there. So uh, do check that out and drop me an email if you want to talk any more about any of this stuff. Yeah. Good, good. And uh, as I said, you can find um, one of the books Dr. Kakane uh, published on Kierkegaard in the description. And when you purchase anything from those Amazon links, I was so excited to find this out. Uh, uh, you can continue to support us in doing what I hope to do, which is pay for my MA. If you look at this little bar right here on your screen, <clears throat> this is uh, the amount of tuition that I raised um, and the amount of tuition that I need to raise for our fall semester. So I thank you guys for helping me get here, but I also want to remind you guys that if you haven't or you're interested in supporting uh, uh, this cause, uh, please uh, click the GoFundMe link in the description. Um, Dr. Cockane, <clears throat> we're going to have to have you back on, uh, I think, when your other book comes back out. But uh, I really enjoyed this, man. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. All right. You guys have a blessed day. I will see you tomorrow. And we're going to be, oh, let me tell you guys, tomorrow who we're speaking with, we're either speaking with Jordan Westling, 
or we're going to, yeah, we're speaking with Jordan Westling on, it is a great book, Love Divide. So I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow to talk about uh, systematic